Good morning. I guess it's time to start. Uh, thanks for coming. My name is Hartmut Kaiser. I'm working at uh, Louisiana State University and I'm uh, leading the, the research group, the Seller Research Group. I would like to talk to you about asynchronous programming modern C++. And those who have seen other talks I have given might say, hey, that is something you have been talking about already. But the recent developments in, in terms of C++ standardization, C++ 20, has allowed me to shed a completely new light on um, asynchronous programming in C++. So I decided to go back and kind of uncover um, and, and look at things from a completely new perspective. Um, as we will see, C++ 20 will allow us to simplify asynchronous programming significantly. If so far you somehow had to pull out your brain, turn it inside out and plug it back in in order to do asynchronous programming correctly, um, the new features C++ 20 will give us, uh, in particular the core weight keyword, um, will allow us to write asynchronous code in a very similar way compared to what we are used to. Um, so it will be much simpler to do that. Um, in case you're wondering what that teaser image is all about, this is a snapshot of a simulation of two white dwarfs, a double white dwarf system in the constellation of Scorpi. It's called SCO1309. And that's what we are doing, um, and that's what we are using our technologies for, to simulate these uh, white dwarf systems. In, and our astrophysicists are very eager to get as much compute power as they can. Um, so I will show some examples of that in the very end. I have shown that picture before, and some of you might have seen it. But since the problems re uh, related to it and the problems I want to highlight have not been solved yet, I'm going to show it again. Um, if you look at uh, paral parallelizing applications today, we have serious problems, especially in the C++ community. Namely, uh, if you look at the tool set we have at our hands, it's like this pile of blocks and nothing fits together. And I will elaborate about that a bit in a, in a moment. The other problem we have, even if we use the existing tools like OpenMP or MPI for distributed applications, we usually see this utilization scheme in our applications. Um, what you see here, uh, one of those the, um, horizontal lines is the utilization for one of the cores. Uh, it shows you about, I don't know, 20 cores. And as you can see, those cores are utilized in bursts, and then nothing happens in between those bursts. Um, this is one of the very characteristic things you see when you start parallelizing your for loops, because after the for loop is done, a barrier is kind of implicitly introduced, and every core, all cores start uh, stop to do anything, and only one core goes ahead and it triggers the next iteration. Uh, obviously, it's very bad for utilization because it, it just throws away about a third of our compute resources we have available. <clears throat> so, what we have faced with in C++ is that we have insufficient parallelism, um, which is kind of imposed by the programming language and programming model we use. If you look at OpenMP, as I already said, just putting a pragma OpenMP4 in front of your for loop will give you parallelization of that for loop but it will introduce that barrier in the end of the loop, which, has, which will join all the threads together, will make all the cores wait for a single core to do things. And yes, I know about OpenMP uh, no wait, so don't ask me about that, um, but it's of no use because it doesn't tell you when the loop is actually done. So if you use OpenMP no wait, you can continue into the next loop, but you will not know when you're actually done with that loop. So it's not really useful in, in the general context. Um, if you look at MPI, for those of you who have, dis have done distributed computing, MPI is kind of the de facto standard of doing uh, distributing work across a machine, a big machine. There, you usually see global communication barriers after each time step, with the same effect as I, I showed uh, for, for the single node case before. 
um, we are faced with oversynchronization of more things than required by the algorithm itself. Again, MPI forces, well, the straightforward use of MPI usually leads to applications where all nodes, all communicating nodes, are in lockstep. So all of them do computation, then all of them do communication, and then computation again, communication, and so on. Which is not good because we are throwing away half of the machine, right? When communication is going on, no computation is happening, and vice versa. Uh, we have insufficient coordination between the on-node and off-node parallelism. And by off-node, I also mean CUDA, uh, GPUs, other specialized hardware. Each of those parallelism different types of parallelism have uh, completely different tools. And usually these tools are not, or the tool makers are barely talking to each other. So try doing an MPI call on an OpenMP thread. It will be just a disaster because it will segfold right away and things like that. So these different programming models don't integrate well. And last but not least, um, we have, well, as I already said, we have very distinct program models for the different types of parallelism, CUDA, OpenMP, MPI, whatnot. Um, in my talk two years ago here on, on, at CPPCon, I tried to come up with a, with a couple of rules of thumb you have to, or you should look for when you parallelize your applications. Um, and I won't just quickly reiterate those because the rest of the talk will kind of always go back and, and reiterate that in, in different ways. You want to uh, uh, parallelize your applications as much as humanly possible. And of those, those of you who have uh, seen, and you probably have seen it, Amdahl's law, it kind of tells you that in, in strong scaling scenarios, even a minor piece in the application that is not parallelized will cause the overall scaling to be severely limited. You want to use a programming environment that embraces slow, the slow factors. Uh, I'm, what I mean by slow is starvation, not enough parallelism, latencies, you have to wait for something to happen, uh, some time distance delay to some service you're waiting for, memory access, uh, networking, essentially everything that is kind of limited by the speed of light. Overheads, um, code that needs to be executed in order to manage parallelism. So that's things you don't have to execute if you don't have parallelism. So it's really bad. And last but not least, waiting for contention resolution. Contention is having too much parallelism. The memory bandwidth is not sufficient to feed all of the vector units in your, in your CPU and so on and so on. Third, you want to allow for grain size to be variable. And what I mean by that is that when you write your algorithms and you parallelize them, you want to be able to control the amount of work performed on a single thread in that parallelization scheme. In other words, and I showed that in, in a graph, you want to make the tasks you execute in parallel as small as possible, but not smaller. Last but not least, Oversubscribe wherever you can. So have more work in the system, more data available, more data partitions available than you have cores. And that will allow you to bridge those um, starvation gaps if one of those partitions or one of those pieces of, of your code runs out of work, other pieces of work will be available and you can utilize your, your machine very nicely. Um, and that kind of includes that you want to be able to control the overheads because those are the worst. The more parallelism you have, the larger your overheads are. So we have to find a way to manage them wisely. In other words, the goals when you parallelize your application are, or the goals I would like to strive for when parallelizing applications is to expose as much asynchrony to the programmer without exposing additional concurrency the last you want to do is to deal with a million threats yourself. You want to be able to launch a million tasks and you want to be able to define dependency between those tasks, but you don't want to deal with threats and you don't want to deal with locking schemes. You want to have an environment that kind of fosters value semantics <coughs> and so on. 
we want to make data dependencies explicit. Um, and I will get back to that over and over again during this talk. <coughs> um, if you think about parallelizing compilers, Intel is promising us that they can do a parallelizing compiler for 50 years now, and somehow they can't make it happen. Why is that the case? Well, it's very difficult if you lie under the car and look up, uh, look up and try to figure out what the driver is actually thinking. And that is what the, C++, uh, the, the parallelizing compiler is trying to do. It looks at some code fragments and tries to reconstruct what are the dependencies between those pieces in the code to figure out what can be run in parallel. But if you have a programming model that allows you to um, convey those data dependencies explicitly to the system, that system will have no problem in parallelizing things for you because all it has to do is to wait for all preconditions for a particular task to be met before scheduling that task. And all tasks which have the preconditions met can run in parallel. You don't even have to worry about these things anymore. And we want to have a API that allows you, us to manage that. This is actually a very difficult thing to do. And the C++ standardization community and, and the C++ community in, in, in at large over the last years is trying to come up with these APIs that allow us to have manageable parallelism and utilize all the resources we have at our, at our hands today. Well, as I said, you want to have an environment which allows you to, to do all these things without breaking your neck. And the community has developed these kind of environments over the last years. They even have come up with a term for it. They call it asynchronous many task runtime systems. Um, and I want to quickly digress for a couple of slides and tell you about the runtime system, the AMT system, asynchronous many task runtime system we develop at LSU. It's called HPX. Um, because I believe while it's just an AMT like all the others, but it has certain properties that makes it very interesting to use in the context of C++. Okay, what, what, what's HPX? And what's the, the, why is it so special? It's the only AMT that exposes a API that is absolutely conforming to the C++ standard. And what I mean by that is, if you take a standards conforming, fully parallelized, concurrent C++ program, you can port it easily to HPX by changing the namespace in front of certain functions, and it will run a couple times faster than before. In addition to that, we have added extensions to the standard, and we have proposed those to the standardization committee, and we are still working with the standardization committee to get these things somehow adapted in the standard that allow us to fill the gaps in what the C++11 and later standards in terms of parallelization expose. Um, so the result is that with HPX we can write applications, asynchronous code with millions of threads, billions of threads on these big machines. And we have a unified syntax for local parallelism and for distributed parallelism, which is very interesting, especially for people who want to do distributed work but by no means HPX is limited or constrained by that. You, you, have, you don't have to use the distributed capabilities. So the bottom line is it, it enables a synchronous C++ standard programming model, a term we have coined, and I, I believe, or I hope that I can show you some of those examples kind of demonstrating what you can do with that. The actual idea why we do that is uh, because there's an emergent property showing up if you apply that programming model, namely that your code is suddenly auto-parallelized. And that is a very interesting feature. So you write almost straight normal code as before, but the system is able to auto-parallelize that for you. Um, I'm not going to, to discuss the, the structure here. The important thing is that it exposes a API that is very conforming and to the C++ standard and which is following the C++ 
committee discussions very closely. So we are trying to implement things that are currently in discussion and so on. Um, just a couple of examples, um, just to illustrate that. Uh, all you have to do, you change the namespace and things will work as before. In addition, the last four things are not parallelism or concurrency related, but we have implemented those because we needed to serialize these objects, send it over the wire and uh, use it uh, remotely. And uh, for those four things, we couldn't do that non-intrusively. So we had to re-implement function bind and, and these kind of objects ourselves, these types ourselves. We have implemented the parallel, all the parallel algorithms that are now standard in C++17. Uh, HPX was the first and only system that has all of them implemented. We started implementing them in 2014, and a lot of our experience has went back into the standardization process. Uh, just in case you haven't heard about those standard algorithms, what they do essentially is uh, they add a first argument to all of the standard algorithms, which is either par, sec, for sequential execution and uh, or uh, vectorized execution. And the standard algorithms will do that for you. So it's very simple to switch from code that uses standard algorithms today to C++ uh, 17 parallel algorithms. Um, just an example here and a couple of extensions we had it, have added to that. Um, fill with par just parallelizes that fill. Sometimes you want to be able to be more precise. You want to constrain the execution of, of, your, of your parallel algorithm. You want to say, hey, run that on this NUMA domain only, or run that on these three cores over there. In that case, you define a object which is currently heavily being discussed in the standardization as well, executors, and attach that executor to your execution policy par, and then the algorithm will use only these three cores you want to run things on. Um, what we also have added is additional parameterization, um, but I think that will change in the future slightly. But this is mostly for things like defining affinities, um, for defining chunk sizes, for scheduling uh, um, parameters, and so, and so on. So you can fine tune the workings, inner workings of those algorithms yourself by supplying your own policy types and policy objects. Um, a very important addition in my book we added in HPX is that we implemented asynchronous algorithms, namely algorithms that don't wait to return to you until the work is done, but they return to you immediately, uh, giving you back a future, and I will talk about futures uh, extensively in a second, and uh, we'll make that future ready whenever the algorithm is done doing its thing so that you can go ahead and do other things while the algorithm is working on the side. We did that with uh, parallel task execution policies, uh, um, and we instantiate those with par parentheses task, and I will use that syntax all over the place. Please note that this is not what is going to happen in the standard. They probably will introduce special names for it, like async fill or async copy, but the semantics will be very much the same. Okay, let's talk about futures. Most of you have heard about futures, have used them. Sadly enough, the futures introduced in C++11 are completely useless uh, because all you can do, you can wait for them, you can call get and uh, then they will give you the value, but you have no way to compose them, you have no way to attach continuations and so on. So that's one of the points we have added to HPX to great success and which is very important in, in, the, in the context of the things I will talk about. So let, let me give you an example. We want to calculate the universal answer of life and universe and everything else. Um, so we write a function which actually calculates that, call it universal answer. Then we create a machine, deep thought, uh, which we task with calculating that answer. So we call async, pass that function, uh, function pointer to it and say, hey, execute that on a different thread for me. Give me a future back. And whenever you are done doing that, make sure the future gets the value. Then I can go on with my life for 7.5 million years because we know that it will take that long to calculate 42. If not, just go back to the literature, you will, you will find that uh, easily. And when I'm finally sick and tired of waiting, I just call get on the future and two things could happen. 
either the value has been delivered to the future already, in which case I just get just returns a value to you, or the value has not been de delivered yet, in which case get will suspend and wait until the value will come. So from your perspective, it's a very clean code because all you do is get and whenever the value comes in, you will be, uh, it will be returned to you. Very nice. Um, that scheme kind of demonstrates that in a, in a more abstract way. But the important thing is that futures enable transparent synchronization with producers. It get rid, they get rid completely of the notion of threads. You can even do that if you have only one thread in your system running. So it's completely asynchronous. Um, it, the most important thing is that futures represent the data dependency. So whenever your data is there, you can do something. And if you give that future to the system, it will be able to derive the information which of the tasks depend on it. It makes asynchrony manageable, as you will see. It allows for composition of several asynchronous operations, as you will see. And what I have here turns concurrency into parallelism. That is not literally true, but in our experience, when you start doing asynchronous programming with futures, you usually will use a style of programming that encourages value semantics and uh, you will not have as much trouble with synchronizing things with other threads as if you were doing thread handling yourself. Let me give you a couple of examples. And I want to um, parallelize quicksort. Well, quicksort, because why quicksort? Because it fits on a slide. You can do the same thing with any of your beloved other algorithms or your own code easily. So the same things I will tell you about how to parallelize these things using futures and async apply to, to any other code. And I hope to convince you of that today. So we will assume we're, we're dealing with two random, um, random access iterators that give you the, the range of, of values you want to sort. Um, if there are actually values in between those iterators, what we do, we call partition, which is a standard algorithm that makes sure that all elements that make the past predicate true come first and all the values that for which the predicate returns false come afterwards. So we kind of create a dichotomy around, in this case, the middle point between the two iterators, which makes sure that everything below or before that middle point are smaller than everything after that middle point. And what's left is to, uh, yeah, and partition returns the iterator to that pivot point, which is kind of marking the middle. And then we just call quicksort recursively on the left and on the right sub part of, of our sequence and recurse. Easy as that, um, computer science 101, everybody has seen that. So no surprises here. For simplicity, I have chosen a very simple way to figure out what is my pivot element. In this case, it's just the, the one sitting in the middle. It will work with any other elements, so if you have more sophisticated algorithms to find that pivot, feel free to use it. How do we parallelize that? Well, as I said before, why not just slap par into the partition algorithm and parallelize the, the partitioning process? should actually do the trick, right? Additionally, I have added that additional um, condition that the partition happens only if the size of my input sequence is larger than a certain threshold. This is to support the grain size control because it doesn't make sense to parallelize things if you have only three elements. You want to parallelize things only when you have a significant amount of, of, of data. But otherwise, it's very similar. Um, if it's lower than the threshold, but still something to sort. I just fall back to the sequential sort algorithm the standard gives me, easy enough, so I don't worry about sorting the rest of it. And then I call recursively quicksort and get the same thing again. Quite nice, and probably something you can do in five minutes. But what will happen if you do that? If you do that, you get exactly the effect I showed in the very beginning on my, on my picture, that you have these stripes going on because you have a parallel partition which spawns off a bunch of threads 
they will do work and then these threads will be joining and before and only after everybody has joined, you can go ahead and, and start um, sorting the, the, the left and, and the right part because you can't start sorting the left and the right half before the partitioning is done, right? So you have an implicit dependency here, which we express with that normal sequencing in, in our program order. Now, what if you um, turn that quick sort into something asynchronous? If you futurize it, we call it futurization. So you let quicksort return a future. It's kind of mind boggling. In the end, you can think of it, hey, that quicksort, I kick it off, and whenever it's done, it comes back to me with a result and make that future ready. But essentially, it will return right away. I call quicksort, it will return right away, gives me a future, and then it starts doing its thing in the background. That makes things a bit more complicated, and please bear with me. This is the old code which still requires to turn your brain around. And I will quickly go to the next slide and give you the, the actual code we can write today with C++20. But I want to go into that detail because that, in my opinion, highlights certain, certain points I want to make. So what we do, instead of calling partition with par, we call partition with par task. That means par task is an asynchronous algorithm which gives us a future which will become ready whenever the partitioning step is done. Now we have to find a way to wait before calling the, the uh, quick sorts on the left and the, and the right half. But since we have a future, we can't really just rely on program flow. We have to explicitly attach the rest of the code as a continuation to our future. And we do that with dot then. Dot then means execute the lambda I give you whenever you become ready. So whenever pivot will become ready, whenever the partitioning step is done, it will call that lambda I'm passing to that then function here. And what that then function, what that lambda does, well, it just extracts a pivot point from the future it gets passed in and calls the left and right quicksort, which, don't forget, now return futures themselves. So I have to have some compositional facility that allows me to say, hey, I have two futures, please give me another future which becomes ready when those two futures have become ready. And that, that facility is called when all. And when all itself gives you the future which will become ready when the whole step is done. Quite mind boggling. And, and the code is difficult to read and difficult to follow, but does its job excellently. Because what's happening here is, um, instead of, um, of running the quicksort directly, during the execution of quicksort, the quicksort function itself returns a future which has dependencies attached to it. Because each of the recursion steps gives it another future which are used as dependencies for the high up, uh, for, for, the, for the next level. So the function now returns a dependency tree which in structure corresponds to the execution tree, the, the, the required execution flow you, you had in mind before. And that tree can be unraveled and executed with full speed, completely asynchronously, completely with synchronization. And that is a trick that allows you to get rid of all the synchronization because the tree will be executed with full speed and obeying all the dependencies because the next level up will be only executed when the level before is done doing things. Well, as I said, this is not quite nice. So let's turn to C++20 and let's see what we can do there. Um, Quicksort again returns a future, the same logic. But what I do now, instead of uh, uh, taking the future from the partition, I use a co-weight operator which is defined or standardized in C++20, which will do exactly the same thing as I explained before with my future dependency tree. It will essentially suspend the operation at this point and attach the rest of the function as a continuation to the thing it, it, it returns. So in this case, our code simplifies a lot because all we have to do, we use what we had before, sprinkle two core weights in it, and we get a fully asynchronous, fully parallelized, full speed synchronization-less execution of a quicksort. And the performance gain you get from making it asynchronous is tremendous. I don't have numbers here, but we have measured it and it's significant. You can fill those gaps in the execution I showed in the very beginning. Thanks to C++20, mind-boggling, 
I really like it. It's really cool. So from now on, in the examples to come, I will not even bother to give you that intermediate step of creating that future dependency tree anymore. I will give you just the core weight version of the parallelized code to give you a nice juxtaposition of how does the straight code look like and how does the fully parallelized code look like um, afterwards. For, as an example for the iterative parallelism, I went back to uh, Sean Perrin's talk in 2013 where he was developing a new algorithm. And what he was doing there is saying, okay, you have a sequence of, of elements and they have some marking, some tag. And what you want to do, you want to reorder your sequence in a way that all marked objects are in the middle and all unmarked are on the sides. And if you know Sean Parent, you probably uh, realize that you can do that easily with a standard algorithm. And no, it's not rotate. So if you think it's rotate, it's not. Um, it's partition. And the trick is that you divide your problem into two problems, the problem above the line and the problem below the line. The problem, and both are partition steps. So you partition the things above the red line and below the red line and you get your reordering. The, the code, which is taken verbatim from, from uh, Sean's slides, looks like this. He called the algorithm gather, which uh, receives three iterators, the first, the last, the insertion point, and the predicate, and the predicate decides whether one of those elements is marked or not. And then you call partition twice. You partition from the first to the insertion point with the negated of, um, predicate and then from the insertion point to the, to the end with a, with a straight predicate. And return a pair of iterators, um, which is very useful because partition gives you, returns the iterator, as I said, to the partitioning point. So the pair of iterators gives you the range of where the new elements have been inserted in your sequence and you can do things with that afterwards. Very useful. So how would you turn that into something asynchronous? Well, you already guessed it. You call it Gaza async, just for, because I didn't come up with a better name. Um, call your stable partition with par task, which gives you two futures. And please note, I'm not only parallelizing the partitioning step, but I'm overlapping the partitioning step because both partitioning steps can run at the same time if you have sufficient resources in your system. It's asynchronous, right? I'm kicking them off and I'm getting futures and the system somehow runs these things as it goes. And now I have to synchronize with that. So all I do, I do co-weight on both futures, create my pair from whatever co-weight returns and co-return result to the user. Done. So again, if you compare that code with the original sequential code, you actually see almost no difference. It's very straightforward to take sequential code and turn that into fully parallelized, fully asynchronous code by using C++ 20 features and some runtime system capabilities like paratask for the partitioning step um, that, that are very useful because they are synchronous to begin with. A last example. And these two examples were local parallelism only on note. The last example I want to um, talk about is about distributed computing. And if you remember the image in the very beginning, these two white dwarfs is a simulation which is uh, we use to simulate these, these double white dwarf systems. It's a very complex simulation because it has three different physics models in it. It has a very sophisticated refinement model in there and so on and so on. And um, we use this kind of asynchronous communication in that application and I want to talk about that here. Uh, we have introduced the notion of channels. Those who know Go, this is no surprise. Channels are very nice kind of pipelines where one end, one thread shoves values into the channel and the other thread can pull them out and sequence like a pipeline. And those things are very useful in, in distributed work because what you can do, you create a channel on one node, send it over the wire and the other node can start doing communication. As easy as that. So it's a very high level abstraction for these communication operations we need. There, 
asynchronous in nature. Well, you would expect that. We have implemented them in a way that the get and the set function on the channel both return a future. The get, the future you get back when you call get, will become ready when a value is available. And the future that you get back from calling set will become ready whenever the channel is, has, was able to process your, your value you have uh, given to the channel. Uh, now I have to diverge a bit. I don't know if everybody knows how these uh, scientific applications work. What you usually do, you discretize your physical space you want to simulate into single points. And then you get a bunch of points, millions of those, which are way too many to represent on a single node, on a single machine. So you kind of cut that space in pieces and distribute those pieces across a machine and have one of those partitions or many of those partitions on each of the nodes and organize boundary exchanges between the neighboring partitions to get your integration scheme running. And what we do here, um, those are the partitions in this scheme. Uh, we use channels to communicate the boundaries. In that uh, picture, you see four of those partitions, A, B, C, D. B is the only one, uh, only partition that has received all its neighboring data, so it can proceed to the next time step. A still has to wait for its data from C, and D has still to wait for its data from C. In uh, usually use communication schemes based on MPI, and uh, you usually would wait for C to reach the same point in, in your simulation before you can proceed. But with, with channels, you can nicely decouple the time steps in the different part partitions. And please note, those partitions don't have to be on different machines in a system. They can be on the same system. Actually, you want to have many more partitions on a single node than you have cores available. Just to fill the gaps in utilization, you might face from, from effects, uh, communication latencies, and, and, and things like that. So let's look at the next time step. B has started to uh, work on the next time step. And once B is done, it can communicate the next time step already to its neighbors while everybody else is still waiting for C there. Um, so the, the time stepping in, in, in the partitioning scheme in, with channels is very much decoupled, which is exactly what we want. So everything is very asynchronous. So let's look at how can we implement that. It looks fairly complicated, but as you will see, it's actually easier than the quicksort, almost. Um, I assume that this function simulate is called for each of the partitions. So you create one thread for each of the partitions and execute that function for each of the partitions. And steps is the number of time steps you want to take. With co-await, it's straightforward. You just do a loop from zero to number of steps and you perform one time step, assuming that the one time step returns a future, representing the calculation of that time step. So we call wait for it, and then we go to the next time step. Note the simulate function again returns the future itself, and that future, as I said before, represents the whole execution tree of all time steps, of the whole loop, where each of the elements in that tree represent all trees, or the, the whole tree of calculating the time step, and I will generate that now. So let's figure out how that function perform one time step actually looks like. Um, we have four boundaries, as I showed in my, my figure, and once the data for one boundary has been received, I actually can do the update for that region already, and I even can send back the results uh, to, to the neighbor. So what I do, I have four functions, handling upper boundary, right, left, lower boundary, and I will show you uh, how they look like. Again, those functions return futures. And once all the boundaries have been exchanged and all the work has been done on the boundaries, that's why co wait when all, same scheme as before, I do the loop to handle the inner elements in my, in my partition. And in this case, I just do a parallel task, again, a for loop, uh, and co wait for it, and done. So the perform one time step returns an execution tree, a dependency tree of futures that represents the whole execution of, of the whole part, uh, partition in one time step. And now look at the upper boundary function. As I said, we have two channels. One channel is called channel up from. That is the one receiving the data. I co-await on calling get on that channel. 
It will give me the data that represents the boundary exchange that comes from above. I do the update of my data, whatever needs to be done there. I left that out for brevity. And in the end, I send the result I got back to the, to the upper channel by calling set on the opposite channel, which points in the, in the other direction. Simple as that, done. That is your whole time stepping mechanism, which will generate a huge execution tree, which can run at full speed. And since you have many of those, remember, you have one tree per partition, and they are all in a system. The system can choose things which are ready to go ahead, because there's always something to go ahead, which will make your utilization in your local node very nice. And even if you have communication going on that part of the channels go over the wire, which will take longer, obviously, than local communication, you can compensate for that, and you can overlap that communication very nicely with, with computation without even having to, to break your neck while writing the code. It's kind of happening completely on its own in the background. So C++ 20 for the win, definitely. And I'm very excited to, to, uh, to have that in my hands and that all my compilers will support co-weight. And I have to admit that uh, the use of co weight I have shown you is probably not what the inventors of co weight and co return had in mind. They were thinking about coroutines and how to do coroutine working. But if you squint at it, it's actually an asymmetric coroutine, what we are building here, where we always give back to the, to the scheduler, and the scheduler is executing our, our task as coroutines. And that's why that co weight works very nicely in that context. The other note I want to um, mention here is that you might wonder, co-weight is a language feature in C++20, and I'm using it with HPX Futures. But that's the beauty of co-weight. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about it. Uh, there's definitely a talk this week about coroutines, and Gore probably will, will uh, give his, his uh, um, advertisement speech about them. Um, but just to, for you to understand that. What the compiler does when it sees co-await, it will instantiate a template with a given name. And if you specialize that template for your types, co-await will work with your types. So it's a very nice integration of library code with a compiler through template instantiation. Beautiful. Okay, so what I showed you and what I, what I talked about is a technique we call futurization. So it's a technique allowing to automatically, almost automatically, well, automatically, don't take it literally, but it's a very well-defined process how you can get from the sequential code to the fully asynchronous parallel code. And I showed you some examples that it's really straightforward to do. Um, so you can transform your code, uh, which delays direct execution in order to avoid synchronization, which turns your straight code you had before into futurized code, your code no longer calculates the results, but generates an execution tree that represents the original algorithm, and the structure of that execution tree is equivalent to the structure of the execution flow in your algorithm. And if the tree is then executed by the runtime system, because that's what runtime systems do, it produces the same result as your original code, because the tree represents the same algorithmic structure as you had before. And the execution of the tree is performed with maximum speed, without synchronization, depending only on the dependencies which are made explicit using the core weight in your original code. So the return futures and core weight allow you to convey the data dependencies of your algorithm to the system, and the system can actually, all it has to do, it has to wait for all preconditions to be met before triggering the next operation. As I said, this execution exposes a very nice emergent property of being auto, almost auto-parallelized. Because the system takes care of parallelization because it knows everything about your dependencies between the tasks you actually run. Very nice. Some recent results. Um, just a couple of nice pictures because I know listening to talks is boring, so nice pictures is always a nice thing to have. This is a 3D 
a cut through the 3D space of a simulation of these two white dwarfs. The isosurfaces you see are density surfaces. Uh, for me, not being a physicist, that doesn't mean anything. There might be physicists in the room who might be able to interpret that much better than I can. But anyway, I thought it looks nice, so why not do that? Why not show it? Um, the mesh, the computational mesh, or the, the computational space in, in that application is a full 3D where the regions of interest are refined dynamically during runtime. Because we don't know how these stars are evolved and where the physics is actually happening. And we don't want to simulate with very high precision the surroundings of the star where nothing is happening. We are refining that computational space in, in, in the regions uh, we are interested in, in, in a very deep way. And uh, I, I will show you that in more detail in a second. Right, here. Here you see it very nicely that there are uh, eight or nine different refinement levels going on in, in that simulation, right? You, the, the squares are getting smaller and smaller and smaller the more you get to the, to the actual action where the physics is happening. The other thing which you might actually see, I'm not sure of that, yeah, it's visible very nicely. One of the stars is actually a bit less massive than the other and it's losing matter through that uh, accretion disk. So matter is kind of sucked up from one of the stars and the other star is getting bigger and bigger. And this is one of the reasons we look at these systems because what they do is um, they, they coalesce and they get closer and closer and closer to each other because they lose energy through that mass transfer and through uh, gravitational waves they emit. And in the end they merge. And when those white dwarfs merge, we get a supernova uh, of type A1, uh, 1A, which is very important to our astrophysicists because that is what they use to measure distances in the universe. Have you ever wondered how they measure the distances? Nobody can go there and measure it, right? So we have to have some means to figure out what is the distance to, to other galaxies. So they, they watch these events, and since we can model them very nicely, we understand the physics and we can uh, go back and calculate the, the energy that was emitted and uh, compare that to the energy we have measured and that gives us a very nice measure of how far that thing is away. Again, doesn't relate to this conference, I just thought it's a nice video, so I, I showed it here. Some uh, performance results from uh, recent runs of this application, just in case you're interested. Uh, what that graph, uh, shows you, and it's a bit complicated, so I have to explain it. It shows you actually two different measurements at the same time, red and blue. Let's focus on the blue ones only at this point. Um, we have run five different or four different system sizes with different refinement levels. And the x-axis is the number of nodes this simulation has been running on, starting from one node to 5,500 nodes. This was done on Pitt Stained, is the largest supercomputer in Europe, 5,500 um, nodes with 16 cores and a P100, so fully GPUized. And that application actually uses GPUs very heavily. And what you see is how things actually scale. And as you can uh, see in a minute, when you look at weak scaling efficiency, we get roughly 80% from one node to what is that, 1,000 nodes, and strong scaling efficiency about 70% when you scale out from 500 nodes to 2,000 nodes roughly. So very good scaling. And these results, I'm, I'm showing them not to, to show off here, but just to give you evidence that a consequent application of that asynchronous, of that futurization scheme I just described, gives you excellent scaling capabilities, not only on node, but even across a machine where scaling is, is very, very difficult to achieve. So let's get back to that picture. When we said, that's what we started with, after applying that futurization scheme, you get this. Roughly a third of the execution time is shaved off just by applying that scheme. And the, the, the cause not that we are able to make the course do more work or uh, make the course run faster what we can do, we can utilize them much better. We can get rid of those unutilized 
periods of time where the cores do nothing because one single core is joining other threads. And if you overlap everything very nicely, you can squeeze things very nicely together. And an improvement of, of one third is not bad if, if you think about it. Uh, what about that uh, toolkit? Well, I'm exaggerating a bit. This is where we want to go with C++20 and beyond. We want to get to a C++ standard that gives us all the facilities for parallelization and concurrency so that we don't have to depend on ex external libraries anymore. So we want to get rid of the need to use OpenMP for parallelization. We want to get rid of the need to use MPI for the distribution of, uh, of our work across clusters. In the end, we want to have a single nice API and everything works nicely together and can be plugged and played in, in, a, in a very nice way. So I think the morale of that story I wanted to tell you is futurize all the things. Um, and I really hope that you kind of start thinking about that and start trying to apply these techniques to your own code. And you will see that parallelization suddenly loses all its uh, threatening behavior. Parallelization turns into something you can naturally when writing your, your normal code, everyday code. Well, that's all I wanted to tell you. Thank you so much for your attention. Any questions? Uh, hello, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, I'm from the HPC industry myself, and I heard uh, uh, rumors that still MPI is very, very efficient, and I'm, expect I'm surprised to see that. Uh, actually, I would like to hear what exactly performance benefits you have using futures. Well, that graph I showed, that scaling graph, had two curves on it. One was blue, and one was red. The red one was using MPI, the blue one was using libfabrics uh, with RDMA capabilities. Um, and that gave us a speed of a fac factor of three over MPI. And the reason is not that MPI is bad. The reason is that MPI is written in a way that makes it very, very difficult to have asynchronous communication in the background. And futures help you to hide that. Thank you. And that gives you the efficiency. Please. Hello, thanks for your talk. Uh, my question is, what the memory footprint of creating this whole dependency tree in memory at runtime? Is Ex it negligible or...? Excellent question. Um, that tree can grow very, very large and can blow up everything. But we have means in the system that limit the creation of the tree and you can limit that size of the tree to whatever you like it to be. I just skimmed over that in the, in the context of this Please. talk. So at some point you say uh, I finish this sequentially because... No, like you just stop generating the tree be while the tree is being executed. And only when the tree gr uh, gets smaller than a certain size, it starts generating uh, things on, on, on the other end again. Okay. Hey. Eric. Hi, Hartman. Uh, thank you very much. Um, a question about HPX Future. Uh, it seems that it's different than Stood Future in that yep. it's a lazy future. Like it hasn't started until... Uh, you asked for the answer, is that correct? Uh, yes and no. It's different from the standard, um, but it's fully conforming to the concurrency TS. We had what we had there. And you have means to control whether it's lazy or, or eager. I just skimmed over that in, in, in that talk completely. So you have full control over what you want to do. But in the examples of your algorithms where you're co-awaiting them and you're eliminating the synchronization overhead, that would seem to imply, at least to me, that um, those are futures to work that hasn't been scheduled yet. Is that correct? The, it depends on you how you do that. In the examples, it's actually eager, but you can make them lazy. OK, well, then I want to talk to you about how you eliminate let's talk, the synchronization. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. OK, and, let's and talk my, about my that. My other question, real quick, is kind of related to the last question. Um, coroutines often have to allocate a coroutine frame on the heap. Yes. Are you creating? millions or billions of threads. Yes. Um, is, is that, are you finding the coroutine frame allocation to be a problem? Uh, since we're working with futures and we have to allocate the shared state anyway, we, ah, have, okay. we have fused the shared state with a coroutine allocation and so it's no overhead in that regard over what we had before. Thanks. Please.
Hi, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, a question regarding support for the GPU. So that kind of load potentially a lot of parallel execution. I know it's probably a different headache for you, but uh, what are your plans in there and development in that? Uh, GPUs, yeah. How do we integrate GPUs into that? It's a very simple scheme, essentially. You write your kernel. We give you a facility that launches that kernel in a way that gives you a future, so you can integrate that future into the, your overall execution flow. And the rest is on you. So is it implemented already? Is what? It is, is it implemented already? It is. Well, we used it in that application. We, we have used these 5,500 GPUs uh, to was, I don't know, 40, 50% efficiency. So yeah, that was quite nice. Yes. Hi. Um, is your proposal supposed or uh, trying to solve uh, only large scale parallelization or should it uh, solve problems that work on these thingies, on phones? Uh, well, it runs on a Raspberry Pi if you want. No? Okay. So, um, uh, um, as, as it, that's why I gave you these first two examples, which are very, very local and very essentially independent of the size of the machine you're running on. Okay, I so just want to make it clear, sorry. So yes, that I know it. it works on everything from a Raspberry Pi over your device to the biggest machines we have there. Okay, so uh, there was a question previously about the tree. And you said you have a certain threshold after which you stop growing. But does, doesn't that sort of negate the, the idea of futures that, that you feel the asynchronicity? In that way, you have to stop the execution of the main program until you uh, free, free up some of the tree? Well, for once, you ha at some point, you have to wait for this tree to be executed because you're interested in the overall result of whatever the tree is, is doing. In a, but in a but that's that, what, in, what. In a sense, I'm saying that. Uh, it, 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 it would appear that the, some of the calls would appear to be blocking when, when you don't want them to be. That is, the, the waiting for the tree to empty to, to a certain amount would block the, the main thread, so to speak. Well, there are many main threads. Um, what, what, you, what you can think of that tree as having a zone where things have been instantiated. On the front end, new tasks are being generated, and on the back end of that zone, things are being executed. And whenever the depth of the tree gets too large, the threads that create new tasks for the tree are suspended until the execution of the, of the tree can catch up a bit to make the, the size of the tree manageable again. Um, but that doesn't waste any resources because all the compute resources you are using to generate trees are now flipped and used to actually work on the tree until the, the tree depth is, is smaller again. And then part of the core start working on generating new tasks again. So you have kind of a hot zone burning to the execution, through the execution tree and, and limiting your memory space. And that works very well. And there's not much effort to implement. So, so not to bother the discussion with this, we can talk about we, this we can talk later. About that. But I have a further, okay. uh, further question. Uh, from the SG14 point of view, mm. from, from, from an efficiency point of view, uh, uh, regarding trees first, you, uh, with, without this approach, you have a static program. In, in a sense, yes. you've coded it, you, want, you know what it wants to do. Yes. And now this approach replaces something static, hard-coded into the binary, into a dynamically allocated, dynamically created tree. Right. right. That, 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 that's an overhead. That that's an overhead. That it, both in binary size and at runtime. Absolutely. So th that's what I asked you about the size of the problem. The problems that you described, you, you could stuck four random std strings and five std vectors into every future and std function that you call, you'd never measure that because you're doing astronomics. <laughs> but, if you, if you, but if you're doing uh, neural network inf inference on a phone, then you'd measure it in binary size and in runtime. So uh, we know that std function and std futures are horrible in, 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 in both ways. Uh, are you looking at those aspects, not just to try to repeat those same mistakes, like looking at the cogen that you get? Absolutely. Um, the, you might be interested in, in uh, some measurements. Uh, the overhead we measure for a single thread, a HPX thread, that is scheduled, gives you a future, is run, comes back. The overhead for that operation is in the range of one microsecond. 
and a couple of hundred bytes. Um, this might be too large for certain applications, I agree, um, but you have to find a compromise between utilization of your machine and finding convenient ways to increase resource utilization and, uh, and, and your constraints. And I think there's always a middle way you can find for whatever you want to do because there are so many knobs you can turn. Ah, well, my, my, okay, so this is the last thing. I'm just gonna close it down. Okay, sorry. Later. But we can continue talking afterwards. Yes, please. Well, um, first, uh, thank you for this uh, great talk. Um, seems you use a lot of these um, C++ 20 features like Coway, Coroutine, and what, what kind of compiler toolchain are you using in HPX? Well, Coway is supported by the Microsoft compiler and by Clang mm -hmm. today. By next year, it will be supported by all major compilers. I'm sure of that. Mm -hmm. So whatever your compiler is, it will work at some point. All right, so I have a further question. Um, you mentioned HPX can deal with this uh, GPU in a heterogeneous uh, environment. So could you please uh, give a more high level overview about how you deal with this? Uh, do you have a distributed memory layer or? Could, could we do that off, offline just to not to derail the discussion? And time's up in 27 seconds, actually, so. Um, so my question is, are there any debugging tools available? Uh, I can see that the debugging could be a nightmare in this. It is a nightmare, yes. And we're working on creating visual debugging tools for it. Okay, thank you. Hey, Bryce.